I'm Gary Bell and this is a podcast for Free Pigeon Press and my very special guest today is the one and only Claudia Christian. Hi Claudia! Hello! <laughs> right, Claudia, <laughs> I've got some questions for you. Okay. okay, okay. So first of all, congratulations on your continuing media campaign. Uh, one little pill which I was privileged to be involved with was absolutely brilliant and well done on that TEDx talk. I mean, Thank wow. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Uh, That's a lot of people. Mm, I mean, it's just had a crazy number of hits over on YouTube. So my question that sort of leads on from that is, um, with all the exposure we're getting, how long is it going to be before this goes mainstream? I mean, what do you think? Do you think it's going to be five <laughs> years, ten years? Let me look years? into my crystal ball. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, I always have said that it would take about ten years, and now you're celebrating your five-year TSM anniversary today, right? So uh, that's we're five years in. I'm eight years in. Um, the nonprofit C3 Foundation that I started uh, is five years old this year, so I think we're 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 getting close. When we first started this, there was a handful of doctors that that used TSM in the United States, and now we're over 90% covered in the entire country with telemedicine um, and physical doctors uh, that do provide TSM. So that's a massive difference. Um, in addition to that, I think that it, people are just coming around in a in a in a in a big way. Um, I'm doing the Dr. Drew show next weekend, which, as you know, has been a very difficult road to approach uh, traditional 12-step um, individuals that that are proponents of that. Um, so that's a big step for him to even have me on his show. Uh, I'm the keynote speaker at the Western Canadian. Uh, addiction forum, which is just staggering. I mean, who would have thought that I would have opened up their addiction forum? You know, it's so all of these things are are an accumulation of your work, my work, Jenny's work from C3 Foundation, Dr. Roy Escapa's, of course, seminal work uh, that we all got. That's how we all got interested in TSM and how this whole thing took off, and of course, Dr. David Sinclair. But you know, we. I think it's just been um, a sort of snowball, and the snowball is definitely getting bigger. And I think that if we all continue with that same energy, and we get more people like Katie, as we mentioned, um, get uh, more more input from the Robert Rappelins of the world. You know, it's it's just it's great. I think that as long as people keep talking about it, we're going to keep growing, and more people are signing up to change their life with this incredibly successful method. Just a question about my fellow One Little Pill alumni. I mean, the, there was me, there was also Steve, and I think there was another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe there were about three people who were just starting off TSM who you interviewed for the purpose of the documentary. How are they all? I mean, you know how I'm doing, obviously, because yeah. I'm five years on now, but how's, how's everyone else? Well, nobody can compare to you, Gary. You did it for a few months, and then you quit drinking altogether. So you are you are this TSM star. Um, I have a few other people that I've worked with that are are quite like you, but they they drink on occasion. Um, but they were fastidious about complying and uh, extremely um, dedicated. Kept a drink log the whole bit, just like you did. Uh, as far as the individuals in the film, I don't. Um, the woman who was anonymous, I, I, I don't have any way really of, uh, I mean, I, I kept sort of in contact with her, but as you know, there was, uh, you know, pressure from her husband, so I didn't want to stay in touch with her in case he saw the emails and so forth. Um, I wanted to protect her in that manner, so I don't know what, what is going on with her. Steve and I keep in touch, and he's still engaged to that beautiful Alyssa, and um, he's very happy. Uh, you know, he's had an up and down journey. Um, I haven't been in touch recently with Pat Niddle, but I know that she was starting a new business, and she sounded great last time I saw her. Actually, I saw her in Los Angeles, um, and she looked great and seemed great. Uh, who else was there? Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> it's been a while, sweetie. Oh, uh, that the lady whose daughter. Um, she. I don't even think she ever tried TSM. I, I'm not in touch with them either. The woman, the the young lady who took her mother, who had HIV, 
that lady, I'm, I'm not in, I haven't been in touch with her. So there you have it. Right, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just about one little pill. Um, wh where is it available? I mean, I believe it's available on Amazon, isn't it? Uh, is it on yeah. Netflix as well? No, not, not Netflix. Uh, unfortunately, they turned it down. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is on Tubi for free. Right. UBI, uh, and you can watch it on Amazon Prime if you're a Prime member for free. Uh, or you can pay to rent it on Amazon. Or you can just go to onelittlepillmovie.com and rent it for $3.99, and that money goes right to the C3 Foundation. Brilliant, brilliant. So that's our advertisement. That's our product placement for this interview, I think. Yeah. Now, <laughs> that's our product placement for the podcast. Yeah, just talking about pro all things product placement. Um, I mean, this is a bit of a thor thorny subject, but when it comes to television and movies, why is it that all that we ever get is just a a just 12 steps yeah. all of the time you know what can we do to improve the product placement for things like tsm in movies and on tv claudia yeah well unfortunately there is no product there is no meeting where you there's not a book a 12-step book there's roy's book um the cure for alcoholism but I think what, what the bigger bigger issue is, and I've tried to uh, set up a meeting with the Writers Guild and the Producers Guild here in Los Angeles, and they've refused us every time. All I wanted to do was go in with Dr. Adi Jaffe, maybe um, Monica, who did the 13th step, not to yell and scream, but simply to say, look, y you guys are writers, and the year is 2018, and you're still putting every situation where there's somebody who has an addiction, you're do making a 12-step program out and putting that in film and televisions, and that doesn't, that's not reflective of what's really going on in the world. People have been using gabapentin and baclofen and naltrexone and nalmefene and all of these drugs for a long time, and yet you're still, you're still not reflecting that. I mean, they don't even show a Vivitrol shot or an implant. People have been using naltrexone implants for ages. So I think it's, it's uh, we just keep getting stopped. I don't know if that's just a disinterest or if it's somebody high up in the Writers or Producers Guild that's, that's an avid, um, traditional treatment uh, espouser, <laughs> espouser. So I, I don't know. I don't know if it's somebody trying to squash us. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but um, we've tried twice to just voluntarily go in and educate them about various treatments. Not just TSM. This was not a one-sided thing. We were going to go in and say, look, here's a whole bunch of different treatments. Please try and utilize these in your scripts because you're coming across very uh, one-sided and antiquated. It's not helping the public in any way, shape, or form. It's interesting, you know, because I was watching a documentary on Netflix about the wrestler Jake the Snake Roberts from the WWE, and for many years he'd had an alcohol problem. And and just listening to what you were saying there, it, it, it was quite interesting because it seemed as if the documentary about his recovery from alcoholism seemed to delight in showing his um, his struggle, you know, showing him relapsing, and I I felt like a guilty conspirator watching this documentary yeah. because I felt horrible for for him because of the indignity of all all of this being shown when you know I was sort sort of like looking at the screen and just saying, oh please, can someone just give this poor man some naltrexone yeah. rather than pr prolonging this suffering? Um, yeah. Right, just about it's a, it's a circus. Well, that's what that's what celebrity rehab did. It, it it's this Schadenfreude of people watching others crash and burn. And it's it's I would rather do an uplifting story like One Little Pill, where people actually got help and and stayed helped. You know, where they their recovery was fairly easy. I mean, yes, you struggle. Some people struggle through it, and there's also always the painful withdrawal if you're physically dependent when you start. The Sinclair method, you have to, you know, you, you do feel a little bit of withdrawal, but it's not nearly as bad as being thrown into a detoxification and then into a, a rehab facility and then getting out and relapsing. And But this goes back, Gary, to the rock bottom mentality, which we have to stop. This, this entire society, the, the belief that an individual that has an addiction has to hit rock bottom and lose everything before they can seek treatment or commit to treatment. Is barbaric it's absolutely it's unheard of with any other affliction or disease or anything nobody treats anybody this way unless you're an addict 
And this happens to addicts all over the world, and it enrages me. It's disgusting. Yeah, how can you treat a human being like that? You know what? You, I, I actually remember when an individual, when I was suffering at my absolute worst, and somebody told my family, let her lose her house. Let her live on the street. Then she'll get better. Hmm. What, what, what is this punishment mentality? You know, that's why I keep quoting Dr. Keith Humphreys from Stanford. You know, if punishment worked, there wouldn't be any addic addiction. Because <laughs> all we're doing is punishing people. Yeah. And it's, 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 just, it's just outrageous. Would you, you know, you don't do this. Somebody, it's cancer, their chemotherapy uh, doesn't work for them. And you say, well, it's your fault. You didn't commit to it. it, it you didn't pray hard enough. Yeah. I mean, it just seems as if we're sort of like slaves to the three-act play structure insofar as the, 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 when I was watching this documentary, it was like the producers were there saying, God damn it, we need more conflict, we need more struggle. And, and, and it's like they're delighted in showing this poor man, you know, absolutely sort of down and out and relapsing repeatedly. And it, it, and it was to, to satisfy a narrative need, need, not a factual need, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, do, you, have, you, just, you have a yeah, footballer there. In, in the UK, the Paul Gascioni, is that how you pronounce his oh, last name? On. Yeah, I mean that whole, when I lived in the UK and I was watching his people, you know, uh, I mean he was being followed in his, in the height of his disease and, and, and photographed and stalked and nobody was, was pulling him aside and helping him. It was, it, it was disgusting. It, 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 there's some sort of, you're right, it's like a hunt. It's, it's, it's like they they want that narrative, that story, to sell newspapers, to sell uh, hits on their documentary that you watched. It's disgusting. It's I, I, I find it appalling, I, and you would not find this. Would, would anybody be doing a documentary on any other disease while watching the person suffer and not giving them proper treatment? Crazy. Crazy. In any case, just um, just getting on with my questions for you because I've got this little auto cue. Yes, please go I'm ahead. Um, okay, <laughs> just about yet. So sticking to the subject of media, social media, Claudia. What is your advice to someone who is a TSM success story who wants to share their story with, with the world? What What do you think is the best route to go? Like Facebook blogs. YouTube, like Katie, what, and what would be your advice to them? All of it. Uh, if you can see the success with the Facebook pages, the Sinclair Method Warriors, Your Choice, Your Recovery, with our forum, which is more private, but anything, um, I would recommend anything that gets you the, the most amount of, of viewers, obviously. So YouTube is wonderful. Um, make a short film. Make a, a statement. Go on our website, c3foundation.org, and put your testimonial up there to help others. Um, do what I did. Write a book. Make a movie. Include it. If you're a script writer, you're a young movie filmmaker, put the Sinclair Method in for one of your characters. Um, you know, other people have done that. They've, they've, they they've just are trying to support C3 Foundation and C3 Europe. They've actually incorporated into their works, uh, their books, their short stories. Um, and most importantly, talk to everybody you meet about it. I know it sounds absurd, but my first four years of TSM, when, before I became publicly known as sort of the face of TSM, I was all I ever did was I, I talked to people. I talked to my agents, my friends, my I went to dinner parties and went, oh, no, I would have a drink, but I didn't take my pill. Just so they would ask me, what do you mean take your pill? You know, I would always, I, I brought it up all the time. I brought my business cards. I would, you know, I just talk about it. Tell your doctors, especially. Tell everybody, your therapist, your psychotherapist, your GP, uh, any nurses you know, um, emergency uh, EMTs, um, everybody. You know, that's what I say. Just, just never shut up about it. Be passionate about it. And yes, for sure, put it on your Facebook page. Put it on a uh, blog about it. Absolutely. There's a million different ways to spread the word. And every time somebody sees it and they tell somebody and tell somebody again, you could be potentially saving a life. Right, yeah, just about, me. I mean, sticking with the same subject of so, social media and communication. Um, 
I mean, one of the biggest barriers which I've come across when, whilst I've been blogging and whilst I've been YouTubing is just that there seems to be a lot of miscommunication and a lot of misinformation, a lot of uh, confusion and disinformation out there and people seem to confuse the Sinclair method with things like ant abuse, I seem to find that very common. And, and yeah. all these different things, such as you've got to be on the pill your entire life, every day, and uh, all of yeah. that. What sort, sort of things do you come across? Well, the, the biggest one is um, the, because doctors in America, uh, they're not used to prescribing it off-label. So they prescribe it per instructions in the box, and that's once every morning, every single morning. As you and I know, if you take naltrexone in the morning, six hours later or so, it's going to be out of your system. So by the time you do drink at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m., it's it's not going to have any effect on you. And now you've blocked your good endorphins all day long. So if you took it at 6 a.m. and then you engaged in uh, a workout or sex or anything, you've blocked those good endorphins. So in other words, it's the, the, the lack of the lack of knowledge about when to prescribe it as per targeted pharmacological extinction and not per the instructions in the box is the number one thing that I I, uh, I, I see incorrectly. Um, people just don't get it and they're not reading the book and they're not reading the information on my website. They immediately jump to conclusions or hearsay and I really have to say this very strongly. If you're on one of these Facebook pages, please don't give medical advice. It, you know, it's just not safe. Um, in addition to that, Every single person is different. I know personally of people who do low-dose naltrexone for drinking. It works for them. I don't know how, but there's no way in hell I'm going to start telling people, oh, take 12 milligrams or take 4 milligrams. You know, this is completely irresponsible. I'm following what Dr. Sinclair and Dr. Escapa have written about and, and what, what they told me to tell people. I'm not going to suddenly go off on some, no, that's great. Hey, if four milligrams is helping you, but it's just not proven. And, and you know, I, 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 that's what I don't like to see. Whenever I go on these, I dip into these Facebook pages. People are advising somebody else, well, you know, try uh, three milligrams, two hours. Pri and I'm like, no, please don't give, don't give medical advice. Allow the person to talk to a medical professional about it. And if they need to up their dose, they should talk to their doctor about upping their dose because you don't know what their liver looks like. Now, mind you, that said, um, you know, as Dr. Escapa says, 300 milligrams a day and you still wouldn't really be damaging your liver. And nobody takes 300 milligrams a day. So their paracetamol, as he always says, is far more dangerous to your liver. But that said, you know, each... That's that's the one thing I do recommend. I've just seen a lot of um, horse pucky on the internet, as they say. Nice <laughs> a lot of misinterpretations. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I say read the book, stick to the book. If you have questions, there's a ton of information on my website, c3foundation.org. Loads of scientific papers there, plus layman's, everything put in layman's terms. But the bottom line is... Start at 25 milligrams, which is half a pill for the first few sessions so your body gets used to it. Then move up to the full pill, which is 50 milligrams, and take it one hour prior to the first drink of the day. That's for naltrexone. And that is basically the rule. And, and people, you know, take it one hour prior to the first drink of the day. If you're still drinking six hours later, take another tablet. That's another thing is a lot of people say, well, is it four hours or is it 10 hours? That is something that's changed. You know, we, we used to think that you recovered for about 10 to 12 hours, but recently doctors seem to think that it's safer to take another pill between four and eight hours later. You know, it's interesting because reading The Cure for Alcoholism, it's the perfect instruction manual, but it, it's funny that you should say that because I thought that was the only area where it could have done with a little bit more per, perhaps just about the half-life and how long it stays in in the body but otherwise it's absolutely perfect and I always quote it simply because Claudia I'm an absolute coward uh, and the reason why I use facts from the book is because I don't want someone when I'm on a forum I don't want someone to get hurt from some yeah. advice which I've wrong wrongly given and given and then get sued. You know that—that's the reason why I always 
quote the book and why people are sick of me quoting the book. Yeah. Because well, it's it's not just a, a, a fear of, of a lawsuit. It's that we, we can't determine somebody's metabolism. I can't determine how much somebody weighs but through an email. You know, I don't know how quickly they process naltrexone. So to be safe on the safe side, veer on the safe side of safety, if somebody's drinking around the clock, I would definitely say, you know, take one every six hours just to be safe. Now that flies in the face of people like Dr. Adi Jaffe who believes you should take it every four hours. But it also flies in the face of what we used to believe, which was 10 hours. So this is somewhere in the middle and I feel comfortable telling people that. I feel that they'll be covered. It's still, you know, it's, it's still not a massive amount of naltrexone in their system and at least they'll safely be covered. Because I don't, like I said, I don't know. Some people have a really fast metabolism. Some people don't. You know, it, but I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's a, uh, it's a big leap of faith to start giving out, you know, medical advice when you're not a doctor. And for me, I can only give my personal story and what I've seen in other people that I've been dealing with for the past eight years. That's that's what I draw from is, is you know, hundreds if not thousands of people who have contacted me and said, well, I took this amount for this amount of time and then I, you know, they, they all have a different experience. Look at everybody's drink logs, they're all different. Everybody drinks for different reasons, so we can't just say this is this this is this the, the exact same way that everybody's going to deal with naltrexone or nalmethine. Okay, um, yeah, as you know, Claudia, I'm a member of a few different forums. Uh, you know, on Facebook and uh, different message boards, I check in with, and something that seems to come up quite a lot is um, this interest that people have in a convention. TSM. Yeah. What do yeah. you think of that as an idea? I think it's a great idea. I mean, I wish that there was a more concentrated uh, city-wide movement. Um, even my monthly TSM meeting is very sparsely populated, to be honest with you. It's just difficult to find people in one area that are on the Sinclair method, which is why the, the, these Facebook pages work so well, because you can get three to 500 people on a page that live all over the world. Um, as far as doing a convention, I think that's a great idea because then we could actually all meet up someplace in the middle and um, meet each other and, and make friendships just like they do at sci-fi conventions. Listen, I've been doing conventions since 1994, so uh, I'm certainly a proponent of them and I know how they can bring people together and what a positive message they can bring and also the friendships that, that, that endure through time. I've met people at conventions who I'm still friends with 15 years later. Um, so I'm all for it, and I think that we could bring a lot of uh, great speakers in. I think that we could have um, you know some nice booths set up with fancy keychains. <laughs> people can bring in their little uh, accoutrement and paraphernalia for the Sinclair method tips. Um, no, I think it would be more of a bonding time. I think we could have impromptu meetings and discussions and it would be terrific. <coughs> I think it will also be really cool for a lot of people who've only ever communicated via Facebook to meet in person Yeah. and to meet face to face. Um, ju just because people are often quite refreshingly different to how yeah. you might perceive them to be online. I mean, I, I, I still have memories of Joanna saying to me that I'm nothing, nothing like she thought that I would be from reading my blog. She had yeah. this image of this Oxford-educated Tweedy bloke with a <laughs> you know. so uh, uh, she, she didn't sort of think that I was this northern lout that I am. Um, you know, <laughs> no idea, given the cadence of my writing, but, you know, yeah. obviously my spoken speech is very different to my, um, to, to my style of writing. Okay then, Claudia, last question. You're less militant in person, Gary. <laughs> You're less militant in person. <laughs> I, I am, you know, I mean, it's funny. People always say that I sound really angry. Um, in my writing, and I don't think I do. I think, it's anger. I, think I don't think it's anger. I think you're emphatic. You're 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 passionate. Mm -hmm. I see. I read it and feel you're passionate and you're knowledgeable, and that's a strong thing. You have a mighty mighty sword with your pen. 
<laughs> you used it well, my lord. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, my lady. Um, I, I cannot believe I just said that sentence. <laughs> okay, leading on very quickly to the last question. Okay. Um, Bill Kicking Gunn. me off, folks. <laughs> oh, God, what are you like? Bill, Bill W. Okay. Yes. What, you know, let's suppose we have a time machine. What do you think he would make of the Sinclair method if we could whiz him to, hit, to the here and now? What I think he would be at the at the Sinclair Method convention. <laughs> I think he would be there. I think uh, he would be one of our keynote speakers. I think Bill W. would embrace this method. I think that he certainly uh, showed all of us that it's experimentation with um, with various substances uh, is not a bad thing. He tried massive doses of niacin. He tried LSD. He tried a myriad of things to fix his condition. Um, and unfortunately, you know, according to some sources, it didn't work. He died still craving alcohol, still wanting alcohol. Um, and that white knuckling cannot have been fun for him to endure for that long. Uh, I think that he would have totally embraced naltrexone and nalmaphene and the thought of targeted extinction. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, what AA is states the desire to quit drinking i think e even he would see looking back saying there's so many people who the program didn't work for and what about those individuals who couldn't spontaneously go into remission as they say spontaneously quit which i guess some people estimate is about eight percent of the population what about that 92 percent of the population who kept relapsing and relapsing and relapsing i'm sure he would have felt in his heart that these people deserved a chance. And once they became sober, if that was their goal, they could come back into the fold. But yeah, let them do TSM. Let them leave and do TSM and come back to a, a clear-minded and, 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 you know, so so-called engaged in the process. As if I've been to lots of AA meetings, and believe me, I've looked around, and there are some people who are comfortable and happy there. There's a huge amount of people who are white-knuckling or, or fidgeting or looking around. They're not listening to the speakers. They're not taking in those stories. They're thinking, I can't drink, I can't drink, I can't drink, I can't drink. You know, it's that, uh, I had that, that addict voice in my head, and it's a horrible broken record. You know, once that's gone, then you can focus on your therapist or your AA meeting or your smart recovery meeting or any of the moderation management because you're clear and you don't have that incessant babble, that committee telling you, I can't have a drink, can't have a drink, can't have a drink. Or I want to drink, I want to drink, I want to drink. So, you know, once that's gone, I'm sure that Bill W. would have appreciated that enormously because it would have helped him as well. And on that note, thank you very much. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. It's, it, it's been quite fun, this. And I always enjoy speaking to you, Gary. I always enjoy. <laughs> it's, it's been a very memorable fifth anniversary for me. Anyway, I'm, that way. I'm just incredibly proud of you. You literally are the TSM poster child. I'm not, that's for sure. You are. <laughs> you are the TSM poster child. <laughs> and I'm very proud of you. And uh, and I, I will be uh, uh, hopefully releasing TSM Journey soon. And your story is, is as always, beautifully written and, and wonderful. So thank you for participating in that as well. Okay, thank you. And on that note... Bye-bye. Happy fifth, Gary. Bye now. Here's to another ten. <laughs>